Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon or good morning if you are joining us from uh, Europe. Uh, welcome to this uh, Institute for Emerging Market Studies seminar on sanctions on Russia implications for emerging markets. So as you all know, um, the Ukrainian crisis, which started uh, probably just over a month ago, uh, has led to a series of quite far-reaching uh, sanctions uh, on Russia. Uh, the US government and its allies have rolled out quite uh, comprehensive, a comprehensive set of measures, including the freezing of Russian assets abroad, uh, banning Russian banks from SWIFT. Uh, and all these have effectively, or to, to a certain extent, restricted the Russian governments uh, and the Russian central bank's access to its foreign reserves and limited its ability to access uh, global markets and even its ability to finance itself. So today's session, we're going to look at the impacts and implications for emerging markets uh, arising from these sanctions, as well as from the Ukrainian crisis more generally. Uh, so I'm joined by uh, four uh, expert speakers. Uh, I'll, I'll introduce them just before uh, they speak. So we'll, to, to kick us off, uh, really there's no better person than Dr. Alicia uh, Garcia Herrero. She's the Chief Economist at, uh, for uh, Asia Pacific at Nephesis. She's also an adjunct professor here at uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Alicia, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Donald. It's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to, to particip participate in seminars organized by Hong Kong USD and especially the Institute of Emerging Market Studies because you always choose the hottest topics at the rightest time, if I may say so. And um, I have to say, I've been scratching my head on this one because um, trying to assess the impact of sanctions is very hard because these are very different sanctions from those we've had in the past. And uh, to a large extent, the sanctions we had seen so far, you know, North Korea or even you know, Iran, Venezuela are really like much more inward looking. I mean, the country as such and, and much less uh, what are the implications for the rest of the world. So that makes our life much harder now. We need to think out of the box. And um, the problem here is that being the first speaker, I just worry that I'm going to be slightly perhaps contrarian to what people might be expecting me to say, namely that these sanctions have massive implications for the world. I'm actually going to say they don't. What really has massive implications for the world is the war itself, more than the sanctions themselves. And let me go through the reasoning for this. So, um, first of all, um, I mean, there's so many things happening other than the war that are already quite negative. I was rereading the World Economic Outlook. We're, we're, we're expecting a much worse coming very soon, as you know. But I was already reading the previous one. And it was starting with rising caseloads, a disrupted recovery, and higher inflation, just, just to start. Yeah. And since then, by the way, this, this uh, we already reduced China's growth rate below five, uh, even Europe, the US, I mean, everybody coming down, the emerging world, which is what, uh, you know, what is interesting uh, for us today. And that was before uh, the Omicron wave in China and let alone the war. So, so whether we think that everything we see is sanctions needs to be looked through this, you know, uh, through, this, through this reality that the situation was actually getting poorer and poorer, inflation being a very important point uh, in, in mind, energy prices were already high, they're even higher, but we were already on that slope. And I want to highlight that, that it's not just because we have sanctions that everything isn't working. Um, for the uh, impact of the war, uh, I think there's three types of, um, uh, sorry, uh, let me, I shouldn't forget because it's extremely important for the emerging world that uh, beyond everything I said, we also had a little bit of a hesitance, if not now I, I feel it's even irresponsibility of the G20 in Italy, not agreeing on anything on debt. If you, re if you recall, the SSI basically came to an end in December uh, 2021 at the worst of all times, because now we're in the midst of a much bigger 
um, uh, deceleration for the emerging world, and they are supposed to pay what they hadn't paid for two years since March 2020. Uh, at the, and at that and at the and at the time in which the Fed has decided to go all the way to six seven hikes, so just imagine that's the kind of the scenario. So the war brings direct uh, negative linkages to countries uh, either close to to the action Ukraine and Russia, or uh, dependent on certain commodities that are important. This brings me to, for example, Northern Africa and wheat uh, from Ukraine, etc. So you know that direct linkage is obviously very negative. Then we have terms of trade. Um, whether you were importing wheat from Ukraine or not, you do happen to be suffering from higher uh, wheat prices globally, and that's another channel: energy, metals. Uh, nickel, for example. I mean, there's a few winners there. I, I want to be slightly positive on this. So, you know, Indonesia, Malaysia in the region. But overall, this is a negative terms of trade shock for the world overall. And then uh, I don't want to forget uh, mentioning that there's also the supply chain disruptions being uh, worsened because Ukraine is in the midst of Eurasia, which is kind of the new channel that we have found. I mean, this uh, train uh, channel uh, to, to basically speed up um, delivery of goods between China and Europe and whatever is in between. And now this, this, is, this has been clearly disrupted, let alone air cargo, and, and and shipping because of the number of uh, ports that are uh, dysfunctional, either because of sanctions, which was your point, but also because of the war altogether. Uh, and then finally, the geopolitical shock. This, this, this uh, event beyond uh, the economic channels I have mentioned is a geopolitical shock. So that's where the sanctions hit. That's when we start talking sanctions. And I think that geopolitical shock is first of all, uh, um, amplifies the sanctions. So, so just imagine, uh, I just um, was sent an article for comments uh, by uh, a very famous Indian um, scholar uh, who was arguing that uh, how could Europe expect India, rightly so, not to import gas and oil from Russia when Mm, Europe is doing exactly that. I mean, and the point is nobody's asking India not to import. <laughs> Nobody. I mean, you can you can look at every statement, at least from Europe. I don't know whether the US is. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised, but certainly not Europe. Simply because that's not part of the sanctions. I mean, the, this is the amplifying effect I'm trying to uh, come to here. We also hear that Xiaomi has stopped delivering phones to Russia, nobody has told them to do so. That's not part of the sanctions, unless the Ministry of Finance buys the phones, which would be subject to sanctions. But that's not, I guess, we, you know, the, 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 the way in which these phones are delivered. So the point here is that a lot of the amplifying effect of the sanctions comes, comes from individuals' decisions as to the fact that I don't want to be hit by the sanctions, but more importantly, because of the geopolitical reading of the sanctions. You don't want to be caught, especially because you fear that you might be seen as either neutral or even you know, pro-China, and thus you are even more careful. So, um, so I do think that uh, the impact of the sanction is being clearly amplified by private sector decisions, sometimes not only in the emerging world, but also in Europe, we have five, or, or in the West, uh, we have 500 companies leaving Russia. Nobody told them they should. They just decided to do so. Maybe their consumers or their, you know, their clients forced them to do so, but certainly not their governments. So, so we, I think it's important, and I stop here because we want to have a discussion to distinguish between the actual impact of the sanctions and everything else that is blurring the impact of the sanctions. And uh, not to say that the sanctions are good, I'm not going to end up saying that or bad. It's just that we should distinguish uh, all of these factors to really assess what's the impact of the sanctions. That's all from my side. Thank you very much, uh, Alicia, for uh, you know, illustrating the issues and marking them up so clearly. I think the main distinction you made was uh, the direct impact of the sanctions on emerging markets may be quite limited, but really we should look at the second order, third order 
uh, knock-on effects. And I think that's, that's really what has, come, has become more apparent in the last couple of weeks, which is that countries, and you made the point that private sector corporations are interpreting, reading into what uh, the longer-term prospects are, what the longer-term geopolitical, geoeconomics outlook are, and are responding with their own decisions on how they should respond. And we're seeing, as you, as you pointed out, companies uh, moving out or, or relocating out of Russia, uh, you know, you, you, we are seeing uh, even governments, you know, asking themselves if they should still uh, uh, be as reliant as they were on Russian oil and gas. So I think you're absolutely right, I think, in, in making the point that the, the second and third order effects may in fact outweigh the primary or the first order effects of those sanctions uh, on Russia. Uh, so so um, maybe we, we, we should move on first uh, to, to hear from our second and third speakers. Uh, our second speaker, our second panelist would be Professor Edwin Lai, who's a, a professor of economics at our uh, business school at HKUST. And he works on a variety of issues, but not least on the role of the uh, RMB and its internationalization. In fact, his most recent book is precisely on that. It's, it's been, the book has been extremely well received uh, and, and well reviewed. Uh, so one of the questions that has crop, popped up in this uh, crisis is, what does this mean for the role of the RMB as international reserve currency or international trade currency? Uh, does it mean that this is a window of opportunity for, 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 for the RMB as, uh, to play a larger role, uh, given that Russia obviously you know, can't access uh, it's US dollar reserves. More generally, we've heard news about, say, Saudi Arabia looking to you know, uh, sell oil to China in, 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 in the UN uh, using the RMB. So perhaps uh, to illustrate and to help us uh, understand these issues, uh, over to you, uh, Edwin. Hi, uh, uh, Donald and everybody, everybody else. Uh, it's, very, it's my pleasure to speak here. Uh, so. Uh, let me uh, try to uh, address the the, the, the the questions that Dono uh, has stated first, and then um, and then there's also also some other questions that are related uh, about the Renmin B. Um, whether or not uh, this sanction may actually uh, give a boost to Renmin B as a reserve currency, for example, uh, I think. Uh, I have the following thought. Um, so, so let's 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 ask the question in a slightly different way. Does the sanctions on Russia hasten the splitting of the world into currency blocks, with the renminbi block being one of them? Uh, I think uh, it, in some sense, in the in the long run, uh, in the in the um, uh, in the long run, it can actually. Uh, so, so this may be a. a a watershed event in some sense, uh, because on the one hand, um, it can hasten the use of renminbi in countries that want to avoid the sanctions of the US, uh, such as Russia, some Central Asian countries, Pakistan, Iran, some Middle Eastern countries, and some uh, Belt and Road countries. Uh, why? Because now what we, what we see is that, um, um, after the sanctions on Russia, it is apparent that the use of foreign currency as reserve is risky because the access of this foreign currency can be revoked due to political considerations. So, and, and this is actually true of all currencies now, whether it is US dollar or Euro or renminbi. Like in the past, perhaps people may say, well, people are more, more worried about the renminbi because it, they feel that uh, perhaps uh, you know um, that that you know China may may revoke uh, if you use RMB as as a reserve currency. Then maybe one day you know China may revoke your access to to uh, to RMB. Uh, uh, and and uh, so 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 this is a um, uh, you know because of political consideration. Now this risk is not just limited to RMB after this sanction. Uh, this actually, uh, this risk actually exists for all foreign currency reserves. So as a result, uh, uh, countries will will then think, okay, if I have a high risk of being sanctioned by the U.S., maybe I should diversify my foreign reserve. First of all, uh, 
uh, I would diversify into remnant B, uh, one, one, of, one of the obvious uh, candidate, because, uh, you know, um, obviously, you know, Euro and US dollar is, is they, they're just similar, right? I mean, if you get sanctioned, you're sanctioned by both Euro and US dollar, but remnant B is a distinctly different risk. So you want to diversify your risk, you diversify the remnant B. That's the first thing. So it may enhance the, uh, the RMB as a reserve currency for some countries, but on the other hand, it can also make the countries in the West more reluctant to diversify towards the RMB because they fear that China may prevent them from accessing the RMB reserve based on political considerations. So it cuts both ways. Okay, so, so, so that's why, it, it, to me, it, it's, um, it is not clear whether this is good for RMB or not. I mean, it can enhance the RMB as a, as a, you know, as a, a reserve currency for, for some countries, but, but it hurts uh, the other way. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, that, so, but that may hasten uh, the world splitting into, you know, uh, the currency blocks um, more quickly, perhaps. Um, so that's uh, the first thought that I uh, I would think about. Uh, I, I have thought about um, the um, the other thing. I uh, the other the other uh, point I, I think about is um, whether the U.S. dollar uh, as a reserve currency uh, will be uh, undermined. I, I believe in the longer run, indeed, it may. Because exactly because of the reason that I just just mentioned, uh, countries that um, uh, think that they have a high risk of being sanctioned uh, by the U.S. and the West now have got a wake up call or a very rude wake up call uh, that uh, their foreign reserve is really uh, not is not guaranteed that you can even access something that that apparently uh, belongs to you, uh, but <laughs> you 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 cannot even access it. So. So the, 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 the status of the U.S. as a reserve currency in the mind of, uh, of many uh, countries, uh, uh, a lot of these countries may be actually emerging markets. Uh, this is a, a talk about emerging market, right? So, so a lot of these emerging markets that uh, may, may actually have second thought about using U.S. dollar and they may diversify into, uh, let's say, renminbi. But I also want to mention, besides the renminbi, there are other things that may actually rise. And these other things are physical wealth such as oil and gold. Uh, people may think about, you know, because all foreign currencies are not safe. So I, uh, I may not use them as the res foreign reserve. I, at least I, I want to diversify. So I may diversify into oil or gold or some other precious metal or some physical wealth anyway. So, so that may actually lead, lead to that kind of uh, direction. However, uh, oil and gold are actually, the, the prices of these things, this physical wealth are actually very volatile. So it is not ideal. They, they are not ideal as, um, as, uh, as, as foreign reserve. Uh, on the other hand, however, uh, uh, Russia uh, being a country with a lot of oil and gold, they actually think that, that oil and gold may be better foreign reserve, may be better as, as, as their reserve uh, than Western currencies. So, so it may be possible that that one day, you know, countries like Russia or some some uh, resource-rich countries, uh, they may actually, uh, you know, uh, stack up their their resource uh, uh, as um, as um, as reserve, uh, as the central bank reserve, uh, because that has to avoid the risk of of of, of this uh, foreign currency uh, 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 political risk. So this is the second point I I want to mention. Uh, the third point I I, um, uh, I I want to mention is I think uh, earlier uh, uh, um, Donald uh, had uh, uh, pointed uh, has maybe asked me to to talk about whether uh, Russia or Russian entities will be able to circumvent the sanctions through China, for instance, a Chinese version of the SWIFT. Uh, I want to say that uh, probably not. Uh, they probably cannot. Uh, it's not a. It's not a. Uh, 
it's not a messaging system. It's not a messaging system. Swift is a payment messaging system, which is actually used by many, many banks in the world and, and also used by many payment systems in the world. So even CIPS, the Chinese payment system, has to use Swift uh, because, I, uh, it, because payment system is the, uh, is the part of the, uh, okay, so, so funds transfer consists of two parts. The first part is the instructions, and the second part is the transfer of funds. The instructions are taken care of by SWIFT. Uh, in most of the cases, SWIFT is the largest. SWIFT is the largest uh, payment messaging system in the world, by far the largest. And a lot of payments. So the payment system, on the other hand, they take care of the transfer of funds. Okay. So even the Chinese payment system actually has to largely rely on the SWIFT system. So uh, so that's why uh, I do not think unless I mean I can think of that as one caveat which is that trade between Russia and China, if they're denominated in renminbi, they can perhaps uh, uh, bypass the SWIFT uh, because the, they can use CIPS. Uh, if they, if Russia, Russia, China trade uh, denominated in renminbi, they can, buy, they can possibly bypass SWIFT uh, because the CIPS uh, is, is basically for renminbi payment uh, and, and they mess, some of the messaging can be done by CIPS themselves. Uh, they um, so, uh, but that that's only Russia China trade. Okay, any any other trade of Russia uh, they, they, involving other countries, uh, even if they're denominated in renminbi, uh, they, they maybe have some problem because because many banks, uh, many non Chinese banks are not not members of the CIPS and they have to rely on SWIFT. Okay, so so these are the third, third point I, I want to point out. Um, uh, let me see. I think that's probably most of the question that uh, that Donald wants me to to address. Uh, so I believe I should um, I, I should stop here. Yeah. Mm, thanks very much. Uh, um... Edwin for clarifying those issues for us. So certainly one of the reactions we've gotten from uh, Chinese commentators, oh, you know, potentially China might be a winner in this, right? Uh, and it bolsters the role of the RMB and, and potentially helps, uh, uh, you know, bolsters a bilateral trade between China and Russia. Uh, but I, th I think you've, you've done, you know, you, you've, you've clarified that it's actually not uh, so straightforward. Uh, this is uh, you, uh, Barry. I can green. Uh, Edwin, you mentioned the point that countries might look to diversify their foreign reserves holdings away from US dollar, the euro, uh, into the RMB. Barry, Barry, I can green wrote a piece in Project Syndicate. I think a couple of days ago, where he says, or was it maybe it's not Barry? I think it is. I can green. Uh, it says that it's not rate, the main beneficiary, the main winner of this uh, foreign currency, foreign reserves diversification has not really been the RMB. Rather, surprise, somewhat surprisingly, but not so surprisingly based on what you said, uh, the, much of the diversification has been to secondary currencies. Uh, currencies like the Canadian dollar, Australian dollar, both major commodity exporters, uh, even the, Sing do the Singapore dollar and the Swedish krona. Uh, so that's very interesting. right? It's, it, and, and it echoes your point about you know, if, you, if, if, if your foreign reserves are in these major currencies, you are at risk of you know, sanctions or you're at, at risk of, uh, you know, you don't really have, uh, your, your access is not guaranteed. But with these secondary currencies, maybe uh, as, as these currencies, maybe they are more liquid, right? Maybe they are more uh, uh, usable. Uh, and, and I think uh, the chief economist of IMF, uh, Gita Gopinath, also mentioned that she agrees with you in the long run that uh, the role of the US dollar as a reserve currency in the long run or in the very long run, it might be undermined and it might also potentially uh, amplify the growing import or the, or the importance of uh, cryptocurrencies, right? Uh, so, but I think crypto alongside gold and oil, you could add crypto as another things that central banks might uh, increase their holdings in, which would be really ironic, right? Because cryptos are intended to disintermediate central banks and imagine central banks moving mm -hmm. some of the reserves in the cryptocurrency. But I think crypto suffers from the same problem of oil and gold, maybe probably worse in terms of uh, the unstable value and its volatility. So thanks very much for that, Edwin, for, for really uh, crystallizing the issues for us in terms of what it all means for China and what it means for the RMB. Uh, and, and last but not least, uh, or third, actually not even last, a third, I, I want to 
turn to David, who's written quite a bit on, you know, the very issues that Alicia talked about recently, that what we're really seeing is not just economic sanctions, but longer term geopolitical risks. Uh, and Edwin mentioned the point about the, you know, the post potential risk of currency blocks emerging. So that's a major, it's not just an economic issue, it's a, a major geopolitical uh, risk, uh, 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 geopolitical outcome. So David, do you think this is heralds the start? I think you've written a piece which says that this is really the, the beginning of the end, the right? beginning of the end of globalization as we understand it. Uh, would you like to help us uh, 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 you know, elucidate those issues uh, related to what does this mean for the prospects of globalization, which of course has been under stress for the last 10 years, or at least the last 10 years since the global financial crisis. Over to you, David. Thank you very much, uh, Donald. Pleasure to, to be here. The, the piece that you referred to was actually called The uh, End of the Beginning. It was a, a riff off a, a Churchill quote uh, during the war. And basically the idea uh, was that after several years of uh, kind of skirmishing, if you like, you know, Trump trade wars and various uh, sanctions being imposed on China, it seems that something has uh, broken or a, a rupture over the last uh, month or so in terms of uh, certainly in the West countries um, pushing back quite hard against what they perceive to be a a fairly fundamental challenge uh, to the rules-based system. And so my sense is that there is uh, no going back. I mean, I, I, in the fortunate position, uh, in some sense of agreeing uh, in very broad terms with um, both of the previous speakers in terms of uh, their assessment of what's going on, I agree with uh, Alicia, but the sort of short-term or direct effects of the, the sanctions are like, you know, on what's, you know, the 11th largest currency economy in the world, you know, are meaningful, but not uh, transformational. Uh, I also agree with the, uh, the point that Edward made around blocks emerging. I think you know, if we kind of uh, broaden it out to think about the, the outlook for globalization, I think there is a sense in which uh, there are quite profound second and third uh, order effects. It's not simply the sanctions, it's not simply the war, uh, important economically and for humanitarian reasons, though that is. Uh, I think what we're seeing is quite a fundamental uh, shift uh, that's going to play out uh, over time. Now, clearly, there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, but I think we can say a few things with a you know, a fairly high um, or higher level of, of certainty. I mean, I think the first most obvious point is that the economic sanctions that we've seen imposed uh, uh, by North America, Europe, and several countries in the Asia Pacific, South Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, you know, on a G20 uh, member are unprecedented, at least in modern uh, economic history. You know, clearly they're not watertight. Uh, you know, oil and gas exports are still going through to Europe. Uh, India <laughs> is in the market for uh, all exports, as Alicia said, those are not subject to sanctions. So there are, uh, if you like, they're not watertight. Uh, but it has been, compared to what expectations were you know, five, six weeks back, it has been a surprisingly strong, uh, aggressive and coherent set of, uh, of economic sanctions uh, imposed by a fairly broad uh, set of countries. And it's not clear, at least for me, how uh, easy it is supposed to be lifted, now, even in the context uh, of some potential peace deal, which I think is still some way off, it's actually quite hard to see how governments are going to align on having those lifted. And I think the thing that complicates it even further, um, uh, also to Alicia's point, is this is not simply uh, official sanctions. Uh, this in large measure is private companies uh, responding to stakeholder pressure, to supply chain disruptions, as well as the official sanctions, and deciding to uh, either exit physically from the Russian market uh, or to stop doing business uh, with, uh, with Russia. So that goes over and above the uh, official sanctions, over 500 uh, companies, or at least on the, the Yale list, uh, have pulled out of uh, have pulled out of Russia. And it's difficult to see uh, how, at least in the, the near term, uh, those companies would uh, return in a meaningful way uh, to Russia. So I think, you know, both on the official side, the government side, but also on the private sector side, you know, what we have seen uh, is unprecedented. And again, I think it's unprecedented because it's not just uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, barbaric and, and terrible that it is. There's also a sense that this is something more. It's crystallizing you know, a growing challenge uh, to the system, uh, and the West is prepared to, to push back uh, quite aggressively. And I think, as I said, you know, there is no uh, going back. The genie, if you like, is out of the bottle. Uh, and I think what we are going to see is an acceleration of the fragmentation uh, of the global economy. You know, these events, both the war uh, and the, the following sanctions, uh, I think make much more explicit this uh, increasing integration of geopolitical considerations uh, in the international commerce. Now, of course, this is not new. Uh, this has been underway for some time. And you could reasonably argue that, in fact, politics and economics always interact. You know, but over the last several years, you know, as China and the US have begun to uh, skirmish in a more uh, explicit way, you know, that's become a, a more uh, sort of, you know, obvious dynamic. 
uh, and what we've seen with the, the Russia-Ukraine um, uh, conflict and the accompanying sanctions, I think, is to put that uh, on fast forward. So in, in the near term, clearly Russia is going to be locked out of large parts of the global uh, econo economic and financial mainstream, I think, for some time. Uh, as I said, it's the 11th largest uh, economy uh, in the world. So it's not small, but neither is it um, you know, the end of the world. There will be some costs. Uh, the OECD came out uh, last week, I think, <laughs> saying that uh, GDP growth will probably be about a percent lower this year than it would otherwise be. Inflation might be about two, two and a half percent higher than it would otherwise be. So these are you know, not small numbers, but they're not, um, they're not cataclysmic numbers uh, either, <laughs> certainly not compared to the COVID experience. But I think that the bigger issue is this is not going to stay restricted uh, to Russia. Uh, I, I think that the, uh, as I said, the genie is out of the bottle. And I think over time, the big issue, particularly for, uh, for Asian economies, is that this uh, has implications for China. Now, China, you know, how you count, first or second largest economy in the world. And although I think that China is going to be very careful to avoid uh, Western sanctions in the near term, it's going to be careful about how it supports uh, Russia, supply of economic or certainly military goods, uh, the ability to help Russia avoid Western sanctions. I think China will be very, very careful of those issues. But I think the fact that these, the, these Western sanctions create precedent, once you've done it once uh, in a big, meaningful way, it becomes easier to do uh, again when you feel that your you know, the, the, the rules-based system, uh, if you like, is under challenge. So that could be uh, Taiwan, uh, it could be um, you know, concern about human rights issues, it could be any number of things. I think the West, you know, there is precedent, the West, West is now much more uh, alert, if you like, uh, to challenges. It, it has its uh, backup. Uh, and so I think that there is going to be a sense in which the, the, the coupling process that we have seen becomes much more pronounced. Uh, I think that the West and Western companies, by extension, you know, are going to be looking much more carefully uh, at China from a from a private sector perspective. I think the geopolitical risk profile around investing and doing business with China has increased over last month because of these second uh, and third round effects. Uh, I think China, by the same token, this is partly to to, to Edwin's point, is also going to be much more wary about getting exposure to the West, either in terms of currency exposures uh, or in terms of market exposures. So again, this is an acceleration of dynamics that were underway well before Ukraine. If China uh, you know, turning inwards, if you like, more of a domestic focus. Uh, Western governments and Western uh, companies are also looking to decouple on the margin. It's a fairly gradual process because China remains a massively important market. But I think we can begin to see, you know, a, a sort of a speeding up of that uh, decoupling process where both economies are looking to reduce uh, exposure uh, to the others. And so I think what that takes us is a, you know, a global economy, global economic system uh, that is more fragmented and where the lines of fragmentation you know, align, if you like, to contours of kind of geopolitical considerations. Uh, so kind of, if you like, a Western bloc, it's an awkward term, kind of defined broadly, you know, kind of a, a China-oriented bloc, uh, and then a group of countries that are, if you like, trying to balance between the two, you know, countries like India, many of the African countries, some Asian countries are, are kind of in that camp, uh, not wanting to make a choice. Uh, but I think we are going to see, you know, as I said, this much more uh, fragmented system now. I want to be clear that that I don't think means the end of globalization. There's a lot of chatter you know, over the last few years, and again over the last uh, couple of weeks with various letters from major institutional investors that somehow we're reaching the end of an era that we're deglobalization. And, and I think you know it, it's easy to see where that argument comes from, uh, but I think what's more accurate is that we're moving from one era uh, of globalization, which has been very intense, far-flung supply chains, uh, very intense growth and in global flows. Uh, to an era of, of globalization which is much more regional, uh, much more political in nature, uh, much more fragmented, but where global flows can uh, continue, but it's going to be conditioned on these uh, these various factors. And I think the issue both uh, for companies and investors, uh, but also for governments, is figure out how you manage risks uh, in those um, uh, in that environment. Uh, you know, having very significant currency, uh, economic, financial exposures to countries with whom you may have political tensions in the future uh, becomes much higher risk uh, than would have been the case uh, even two, three years back. Uh, so I think it's a much more challenging environment uh, to navigate. Uh, but at the same time, you know, companies will work around. Uh, global flows, global trade, investment, knowledge flows will continue. Uh, but it is going to be you know, a more challenging uh, political environment. You know, and again, coupled with pre-existing trends where you know, technology, uh, drive for supply chain resilience is already causing companies to begin to shorten supply chains, uh, bring activity back home. So I think, you know, the, the Russia-Ukraine situation and the accompanying sanctions are going to lead, I think, to a regime change. 
in the way that the global economic system works, more regional, more fragmented, more political, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think that's in large measure an acceleration of existing trends. Uh, and I think for export dependent uh, markets of which many emerging markets are, particularly uh, in Asia, you know, we're gonna have to think hard about uh, growth models, the nature of those exposures, the nature of counterparty risk. There's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more to think about than, than, than was the case. So for me, uh, you know, my assessment of what we've seen over the last um, month or so, it, it is a, quite a fundamental rupture that over time is going to have significant uh, economic uh, effects on the global system. It's not, uh, it's not uh, to, to Alicia's point, it's not simply the, the sanctions uh, themselves and the direct sense on Russia. It's what that means over time for the extension of those sanctions uh, and for a much more explicit integration of economics and politics. So perhaps let me pause there uh, and hand back to you, Donald. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, uh, David. And I just want to reiterate the, the, the three points you made at the end, which is that you know, global, I, I agree with you, the, the demise of globalization has been grossly exaggerated. Uh, we don't, you know, uh, I don't think we will go into an era of deglobalization where you know, global flows go, go into reverse. But I think I agree with you that we, we will see a fundamental rupture that, that, that there is likely to be a regime change and globalization, uh, will more likely be regional in nature, more fragmented and more politicized and political. And of course, what we've seen in the last few months is really, uh, as, as you pointed out, uh, an amplification of a lot of the stresses that have been that we've that have been placed on globalization since the global financial crisis. Uh, before the GFC, global trade was exceeded uh, global growth in GDP. Post GFC, global trade has been uh, growth in global trade has been far more moderate. Has in, in fact lagged. Uh, growth in uh, global GDP. And then after that, we had the, uh, the US-China trade wars, we've had uh, the pandemic, which of course severely, for a while, this severely disrupted uh, global supply chains, forcing companies into many of the, the kind of uh, strategic rethinking that you talked about, whether, you know, how, how to build up supply chain resilience, how to diversify uh, supply. So, so I, think, I think this is yet a third shock, right, post-global financial crisis on uh, the outlook for globalization. And I think it will and I think what, what this particular shock, uh, how it differs from the US-China trade war and, 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 and COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic is that this is, this is, this is uh, an outright crisis, right? This is an outright crisis of political systems. Uh, and I think that gives policymakers and, 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 and corporates as well a great deal of uh, uh, pause as to how they should chart their way forward. Uh, okay, so to help us make sense of all of this and also to help us uh, kickstart our Q&A session, uh, let me invite my colleague, uh, El Professor Elminas uh, Zaldokas, uh, to, to comment and as well as to uh, raise some uh, questions. Uh, and, and also to, the, to our audience, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I see already one question which I will highlight later, uh, but to... to to precipitate or to catalyze more questions, maybe uh, ask Elminas to, to get us started. Over to you, Elminas. Sure. Well, thanks a lot, and thanks for organizing this event. Uh, I think it's very important to, to start talking uh, uh, about the, the possible uh, implications and knock-on effects that uh, we might have here in Asia. Um, so, uh, so Donald has asked me to uh, to, to to comment on on, on the uh, previous speakers, uh, but uh, you know I, I would like to disagree with something. But uh, I feel that uh, I'm agreeing to to almost uh, everything that is uh, uh, that is being said. Um, yeah, so the, the use of sanctions uh, is, is indeed you know just a reflection of what is happening uh, uh, in, in in Ukraine with the terrible war, uh, and 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 so you know. Probably, probably the, the first order effects are, are indeed coming from the uh, from the war itself. And uh, some things that we already, you know, talked here uh, and the colleagues have uh, have mentioned, uh, but we sh shouldn't also, you know, as Alicia highlighted, you know, Ukraine by itself is a is a transportation uh, hub. There's a, a huge amount of uh, uh, agricultural commodities that come from Ukraine and uh, and affect the prices globally, uh, but also their people, right? So uh, we, we're getting uh, you know, probably four million refugees in uh, in, in in Central uh, Europe at the moment, and and how that would also reshape uh, uh, Europe itself uh, might be uh, something that uh, uh, needs to be uh, thought uh, uh, about a, a little bit. Uh, you know, it's very hard to predict at this point, obviously. Uh, but one one other thing, uh, speaking of Europe, that uh, would probably 
some interpreters at least uh, allude to is, is the stronger Europe, a more united Europe. Uh, not really clear that's going to be the case in the long term, but at least uh, that's one of the interpretations that uh, we have seen. And, uh, and we shouldn't forget there's a EU-China summit happening now, probably uh, uh, today. Uh, so, you know, uh, what's the relationship going to be between uh, EU and, 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 and China or EU and, and Asia more broadly? Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, uh, is something that I probably want to, uh, you know, uh, bring to the discussion uh, uh, later on. Uh, on a, my own work is mainly on the firm level adjustments uh, to, 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 to the uh, to shocks and in particular I have looked into the uh, uh, Russia's sanctions in 2014 in one of my work um, and, and have been looking into how the, these 500 firms uh, been leaving the, uh, the Russian market. Um, and this is another thing that uh, has been uh, raised by, uh, by David, uh, Alicia, and uh, in, to some extent with, by Edwin as well, is, uh, uh, is the setting up the precedent of, uh, of, uh, of leaving a certain market. Uh, if, uh, if consumers or, or public activists are pressuring these firms, uh, if the so-called ESG, environmental social governance investors, um, uh, are trying to take into account uh, the firm's exposure uh, to certain markets, um, you know, where do we draw the line, right? And, and, and whether this uh, creates also the precedent of, uh, uh, you know, pushing those uh, firms uh, to, to leave uh, other markets when, uh, you know, maybe elections don't, don't turn out the way we want it or, 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 you know, where do we draw the line, right? So, um, uh, so, so, so this is something probably that I think I've, I might have seen one of the Alicia's Twitter posts uh, that, that the outflows from China has been increasing uh, uh, lately. Uh, so probably something also to, to, to think about, you know, what, how do we rethink, uh, rethink uh, globalization in, in that respect? And of course, you know, what, uh, what has been raised is that there'll be fragmented, more fragmented markets in terms of uh, uh, the supply chains. Uh, uh, and, uh, and in particular, we already had a massive supply chain shock coming from COVID and then, you know, with the, with the shipping uh, uh, now being uh, quite, uh, uh, quite uh, oversaturated, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of rethinking of how to, to, uh, to, to regionalize those supply chains. But there's something else I think that might uh, also come out and maybe you want to hear your thoughts is sort of intermediation coming into an effect is, you know, you, you don't want to be uh, sort of exposed to the market directly, but you might want to figure out ways of how you uh, how you're exposed to the market indirectly. So sort of uh, creating these uh, uh, intermediary uh, uh, blocks, you know, you're not exporting to, 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 uh, to Russia, but uh, you're exporting, well, that's what happened in the previous round and exporting to Belarus, right? And then exporting to Russia and so on. So, uh, so I wonder sort of how these sort of, some of the economies that are in between uh, that uh, David has, uh, 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 has brought uh, an idea as, you know, Maybe they might be benefiting net benefitors here as being sort of intermediary uh, countries uh, for that. Uh, let me see if uh, I have something else uh, to raise here. Uh, yeah, on 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 on, on the Edwin's points, <laughs> not not a monetary policy expert here, uh, uh, but one thing that's sort of uh, I want to ask him uh, uh, maybe is uh, you know we we see that Russia the Russian ruble is back to the pre uh, pretty much pre-invasion uh, level. Um, so some some of the commentators would ask, you know, maybe those sanctions are not effective, you know, or maybe those sanctions of uh, stopping the uh, use of the dollars in the reserve as a reserve currency are not effective at all. You know, ruble is back uh, because of the central banking operations or, or, or because of the oil price uh, uh, being high. But, uh, you know, maybe that's not the... Uh, that's not a, the, the policy that uh, should have been applied and, and it's not effective. So uh, so maybe some, some thoughts on that. Uh, and, and maybe just to, to conclude uh, on my remarks, uh, I probably would disagree with David on one thing is, uh, is uh, when, when he said, you know, when, when the sanctions are used once, they, uh, they're suppressed and they might be used again. Well, if sanction, I, I would try to say it's the genius out of the bottle. So once the sanctions are used, uh, the firms and the countries will start adjusting to be more resilient uh, to the possibility of those sanctions. So uh, I don't think it's possible that to step in the same river twice that easily in that respect. 
Um, so let me stop here and, 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 and see if we can kickstart the discussion. Mm, thanks very much uh, for Aminas for raising some of those questions. So maybe we can start with uh, Alithia and to, to ask her to, as well as David, since you're based in Europe, uh, about future of uh, EU-China economic relations. And those have been put on pause for a while. And of, and of course, uh, this particular crisis has also, well, uh, if, if, if David is right, it's, it's, it's going to be quite permanent, right? In the sense of uh, advancing decoupling, right? Uh, so so you, do, do both of you or do either of you think that there's any other scenarios here? Uh, or are we likely to see uh, a further decoupling at, insofar as EU-China economic and financial relations are concerned? Maybe we'll start with you, Alicia. Well, um, I would like to, well, first, I don't have the crystal ball, um, I, but what I know, and I very much like all of the presentations so far, first of all, because somehow we're all quite more or less in line with, with the, our idea of the world, um, but there's still, of course, nuances that we can discuss, which is great. I think on the EU-China relation, the one thing that I, I want to highlight is that uh, China is 10 times bigger than Russia. I mean, of course, there is a huge de energy dependence from uh, Russia, not, a, not the whole of Europe, I have to say, like, uh, you know, Portugal, Spain, not at all, zero. But then, you know, you move on west, uh, east, sorry, and, and it becomes uh, very obvious. But it also becomes very obvious uh, based on the plans announced by the German government that it can end pretty fast. You know, the, the, the announcements uh, they've made uh, imply that uh, there will be zero dependence, whether that's possible, but very low dependence, put it this way, from Russia by the end of 2023. As quick as that, and there's a number of reasons, the US, uh, pipelines being built from Algeria through Spain. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's not, and then of course, the uh, speeding up of the green um, transition. So uh, Russia is not essential for Europe. I'm sorry to say that, but it might look essential now, but because of that, it's going to end. Mm. China is a different animal. China is essential for everybody. And that's something we need to realize. Um, but I'd like to use this opportunity to, uh, to state the following, that even if China is essential for everybody, even when you are essential, you do not want to play on your centrality because it's a bad idea. <laughs> Be because sometimes we all harm each other just for the sake of avoiding the centrality that, that creates fear. Yeah, I mean, that's, so, so the point here is that I, I wish we can uh, reach a um, situation by which we believe in this coexistence, codependence, but not excessive dependence. Yeah, because if you move to that excessive dependence, that's when the other one, you know, moves away. And uh, Europe is very close to that. So, so I hope we can keep, you know, like, um, uh, and our brain functioning, put it this way, so that we don't get there. Uh, and we don't think of uh, decoupling all over the place. We, we, I think it's better to think of, you know, places where it's too risky to be. And I think Russia today is because, frankly speaking, we, we thought we had a deal in Istanbul and it seems we don't. I mean, it's like every day the same. So at some point in time, and this is not about values, this is about reliability. This is about trust. <laughs> This, values can be different as long as you, you can operate. So I think for China, the idea is, can we operate? And can we trust so that we can continue? And, mm. and I think that's where we should see the difference so that we don't get into this decoupling mode. And there may be some fragment, fragmentation, but not full decoupling, because that would be horrendous for the global economy, to be frank. Mm. So that's... Mm. Yeah, thanks, Alicia. I think you're right. Uh, oil, gas, natural commodities, as uh, Ricardo Hausman and others have reminded, they're not particularly complex goods. <laughs> it's e relatively easy to find substitutes. I think nuclear power is another uh, alternative uh, besides green energy uh, for much of Europe. Uh, but China's exports are a different kettle of fish, right? Uh, the increasing complexity, 
much less replaceable. And China as a market is also much less replaceable for European exporters. So I think that's a very good reminder that you know, decoupling might not be a linear or uniform process. And uh, we might see fragmentation, but that's a very different thing from saying we'll see decoupling uh, in every aspect of the global economy. Uh, maybe David, I'll ask you to respond also uh, to this broader question of whether sanctions work. I mean, one of the Chinese approaches to this idea that of, of sanctions is that you know you, you don't mix politics and, and business, right? And, and sanctions, uh, the Chinese in particular, find sanctions... Uh, uh, you know, are, are self-defeating. Uh, so, and also, how much, how, how much should we expect this uh, Western cohesion, right? You, this Western unity uh, on the sanctions to last, particularly if they start to bite uh, domestically in, in Europe? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's a few, um, few questions there. On the effectiveness of sanctions, it really depends on what your measure of success is. I mean, it's a little, to me at least, ironic that China says sanctions don't work when it's, you know, if you talk to uh, many countries from Lithuania to South Korea, China has sanctioned <laughs> them many times. Australia. For so <laughs> yeah. it kind of depends on where you're sitting, I suppose. And they yeah. presumably do them because they think they are effective either as a punishment tool or to try and, um, you know, uh, sort of incentivize the, the correct behavior. So, I mean, I, I don't think China is entirely um, <laughs> uh, sort of straight faced on this one. I think, you know, sanctions are used in terms of, you know, in the Russian case, will sanctions work well? Will they change Mr. Putin's calculus in the short term? I think no. You know, longer term, perhaps yes. I think there's also a measure of just kind of punishment. Uh, you know, you can't expect to invade a country and then be part of um, the, the global economic system. Uh, I think there's also a measure of, uh, if you like, deterrence, you know, a shot across the bowels. You know, if countries do this, uh, if this is the kind of behavior that countries show, these are the consequences. And I think, you know, China, if you like, is the kind of implicit um, uh, sort of uh, uh, destination for that, that message, um, uh, if you like. So, you know, will they work? You know, uh, sanctions have got a very, very checkered history historically of uh, working in terms of changing behavior. But I think, you know, that the West has a comparative advantage in economic war. Uh, you know, it's better, I suppose, than sending in tanks and, and missiles and the like. You know, trying to get the correct behavior through economic means as opposed to military means. But, you know, it's, it's not at all clear that they will work in the near term uh, you know, and where they will change the behavior of countries like China longer term, um, uh, we shall see. In terms of Western cohesion, that's a very good question. I, I don't have a, a crystal ball um, uh, either. You know, at the moment, uh, you know, being reasonably new in Europe, I've been um, you know, struck by the level of you know, sort of shared purpose of anger, of shock, of outrage, a sense of kind of common purpose. You know, as uh, Ukrainian refugees, even the Netherlands arriving at my kids' schools, there's a sense of sort of solidarity. Uh, all prices, gas prices have been high for a few months. And so far, I think people, you know, it's politically painful, governments are managing it. Uh, but I think that the short answer is yes, for as long as Russia is in Ukraine invading, you know, the brutality you see on your TV screens, I think, yes, that, that Europe will cohere. You know, will it be able to be sustained for years? I mean, I think that's an open question. That partly gets to the, your question to Alicia about, you know, if these would be extended to China, which I think is a different, um, you know, you can't substitute away from China in the way that you can over time substitute for uh, Russian energy imports. I think that becomes uh, another issue uh, uh, entirely. I think you know, there are meetings uh, uh, underway, in fact, today between uh, EU and uh, Chinese uh, leadership. I think, you know, the Europeans would be, very hesitant to open up another kind of economic front, another source of economic cost. I think it'd be very, very cautious about uh, doing that. But I think there's also a realization, you know, that you know, to, to quote Leon Trotsky, uh, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you, right? So even if you don't want a rupture with China, you know, given the differences in, in kind of interests and values and the like, it, it is inevitable there will be um, periods of disruption, of tension and the like, which may involve some economic costs. So. I think from a European perspective, there is a sense that you don't want to become overly exposed to China. You want mm -hmm. to kind of manage your portfolio uh, of risks. Uh, and so I think, you know, um, a degree of stability, I speak, in the EU-China relationship is more likely than not, which works both from the Chinese side, but also from mm -hmm. a European side. But I don't see a great rapprochement, uh, if you like. Um, I, I think the Europeans will be careful. And I think the other thing to bear in mind is that this is, again, it's not simply about what governments choose to do. Uh, this is also about what companies are choosing to do. So, yes, for many companies, China is a very lucrative market, both as a consumer market, but also in terms of sourcing uh, goods and services uh, from China. It matters a lot to them in a way that Russia simply doesn't. Mm. 
Uh, but at the same time, there is growing stakeholder pressure. You know, consumers are much more sensitive to issues of politics, of human rights, environmental considerations, uh, and the like. And, and so I think, you know, again, having watched and observed what's happened in uh, in Russia and the speed of uh, sort of stakeholder pushback on companies that tried to retain a presence, uh, even scaled down uh, in Russia. I think companies are also now thinking, you know, can I keep stakeholders of all of my respective markets on board at the same time? So I think we are going to see a gradual process, and like gradual process of uh, kind of managing intensity of relationships, uh, mm. right? Uh, I mm. think there's both at a, a company level and a government level, yes, China matters. You can't decouple to Alicia's point completely in China is just too big. Uh, to do that, and the cost would be too high. But I think there's also on the margin going to be a degree of risk management, right? You don't become overly exposed, both governments um, mm. and companies, as a degree of diversification, better supply chains, and, and the like. But again, I think aspects of that were underway you know, pre Ukraine invasion, right? For supply chain resilience, um, for strategic autonomy, uh, because the, you know, the labor cost arbitrage opportunity in China was reducing. So why not put a presence in Vietnam or the Czech Republic or Morocco, wherever mm. it is? So, you know, in a sense, I think this, there's going to be a measure of decoupling. Uh, this is not at all a binary concept. And I think mm -hmm. the events in, in Ukraine probably just kind of, uh, you know, put a, a degree of additional intensity uh, around that. Mm. Thanks very much, David. Uh, Edwin, there was a question. I want to come back to maybe a brief discussion on the international monetary system. Uh, there was a question about SDRs, right? Uh, not just RMB as a... Uh, alternative reserve currency, uh, special drawing rights on, at the IMF. And I, I'm sure your response will be that SDR suffer from the same problem as cryptocurrencies, gold and oil. They're not, they're not really a medium of exchange. Right? But more broadly, do you think, uh, to, to David's point, uh, uh, would you agree with what David said, that um, countries will seek to reduce their dependence, even if they do not completely decouple from China? Uh, they, they will look for, you know, diversify out of China and, 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 and even if they maintain some presence in China? Um, I, I, I agree with uh, uh, David and Alicia that, that, uh, that the Western countries, uh, including EU, uh, would possibly adopt, try to find an optimal level of interdependency with China. In other words, not too close and not too far away. Mm. Uh, that that makes a lot of sense to me, uh, because you because there's always risk, right? I mean, now we know that you know um, uh, the 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 fact that China now uh, the China stands in this conflict, uh, uh, you know, between the West and Russia, it's a little bit ambiguous. So 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 that actually kind of sends a signal to the West. That China is different from them, uh, uh, fundamentally, in, in some fundamental sense, it's quite they they are, seem to be closer to Russia than to the West. That actually gives sends a signal and uh, raise a flag, and and that actually uh, you know uh, I think that makes a lot of sense that, that they try to sort of opt, uh, keep an optimal distance. I do not see them just sort of fled you know fleeing China. I I do not think so. Uh, they, I mean, I mean, they they can always uh, leave if they want. I mean, they the so 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 um, the uh, what I see is 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 that um, you know China's opening. I mean, that, that's one thing that that you have to note that China, in fact, despite all these uh, sort of. Uh, Talks about 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 uh, the U.S. trying to decouple from China and and, and China being a rather uh, you know now now seem to be sort of tightening its grip on on many uh, sectors and so on. But it's still opening. It's actually this is the general direction of the Chinese economy. It is actually opening more and more to the West, uh, including, for example, investment from the U.S. Actually, had had really increased very very fast in the last five years. Uh, and and there's opening to uh, Western entry. Uh, uh, financial companies uh, are allowed to have uh, more than 50% of their share uh, in Chinese operations. Um, yeah, I mean, and and uh, and then a bond market is is really uh, the the Chinese bond market is really opening up to foreigners in uh, big time. Uh, and and uh, the capital account is is opening. Uh, uh, you know, direct investment is opening. 
and, and all that. So, so China is opening. Uh, it, it's a um, it's tricky to deal with China. Okay, that that's one thing. <laughs> I think this is actually interesting. It's tricky to deal with China because on the one hand, economically, it seems to be opening, but on the other hand, you see that they are emphasizing the state power uh, in con in trying to control you know certain sectors and and being also very seems to be very antagonistic uh, 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 in particular towards the US. Uh, it, it is a complex entity that 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 needs to to be handled with care. Uh, so so I think I think that that's why the, this optimal distance kind of theory is, is actually correct. It, it's the right. I, I think that that's probably right. Uh, you, you you want to find out what is the bottom line and and. Uh, uh, but I don't. I do not see uh, Western companies fleeing China or or even fleeing, uh, for example, Hong Kong or 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 things like that. I I, I believe that the, the the cooperation will continue. Uh, uh, thanks very much, Evan. Good, good to know that uh, it's not game over for Hong Kong yet. There was a question. I think I'll open it up to all all panelists. Uh, was it necessary to resort to, I mean, the, the very, before the invasion, I think, you know, I thought that they would not close off Russia's access to SWIFT, right? And, and because that effectively cut off Russia's access to its own US dollar reserves. I mean, it, do, do, you all, do, do you all think that marks a kind of crossing the Rubicon, Rubicon in that what was unthinkable previously as a financial sanction now, now becomes potentially, right? a measure of first resort. Do you think that represents a kind of crossing of the Rubicon or, or do you think this is par for the course and, and that, that this is actually a measured response as opposed to such a drastic response? Maybe Alicia or David and, and, yeah. and obviously- yeah, Very quickly, uh, yeah. actually Iran is out of SWIFT. So it's not the first time we okay. do this or, or we, I mean, somebody does this, certainly not me. <laughs> but having said that, um, actually, for Russia, uh, there's a number of uh, major financial institutions that have not been taken out of SWIFT. Um, and, and therefore, uh, I don't think this is the most relevant, if you ask me, the most relevant sanction that we have introduced. It sounded as if, because there was so much fear about it, but actually the way it has been implemented doesn't make it as relevant. Um, and then also, Bear in mind that you know Swift is basically a messaging system. You could bypass the messaging system if you want to take the risk. So it's it's not if you ask me, and many do not focus on this sanction, but I think it's very important. The the ban on exports of semiconductors could even be more disrupting for China because there what you have is a lot of industrial capability, let alone military capability that can't be sourced. Um, without taking risks, because that's an actual ban. Uh, not everybody has taken that ban, as you know. I mean, China hasn't, uh, but the type of semiconductors that that China may export without components might not be those needed. So in a way, there's a bottleneck. How big the bottleneck, nobody knows. But uh, going back to SWIFT, I don't think that's as big as we thought it would be. Oh, yeah. uh, let, let me say something. Uh, I, I do believe it's something different. Uh, Alicia, uh, which is that uh, it has never happened before that uh, a country's uh, foreign reserve, uh, a country cannot actually access its foreign reserve. Uh, this is the first time. So uh, when when Donald asked whether this is a, has crossed the Rubicon, uh, if you think if, if you define crossing the Rubicon as uh, something that has never happened before, it has. It has it has actually passed uh, across the Rubicon, because because uh, no, no countries, as as far as I can remember, no countries have ever been uh, denied uh, the uh, access to to their foreign reserve. Uh, in a sense that now Russia is not is banned from uh, selling uh, uh, U.S. dollar asset, U.S. dollar based or, or euro based, uh, U.S. dollar denominated or euro denominated uh, asset uh, in the international market, in the foreign, foreign exchange market. This is the first thing. Iran did not have that. It, Iran only was banned from uh, participating in SWIFT. 
so, so this is causing the Rubicon. This is exactly why I pointed out in my, uh, in, in what I just said earlier, that uh, that is actually a watershed. It is a big deal. It is actually a big deal because now everybody know that, okay, foreign reserve, it, even though uh, it belongs to me, is supposed to be belong to me because I bought this US dollar denominated asset. It says this is US treasury bond or whatever. It, I keep it in my central bank and then I could not sell it when I need it. And, and that, that is actually causing the Rubicon. It's actually root, it's very root actually. Uh, and and, and that, that's exactly why uh, I pointed out that uh, uh, many countries that think that they, they may suffer from, uh, they may have, uh, have the risk of being uh, treated the same way like this, will now tend to diversify away from the US dollar or the Euro dollar, uh, or the Euro or, or all these Western currency based foreign reserve. And as a result, because China is just the other side, therefore they will go to China, the renminbi. They, they have, renminbi becomes more attractive uh, because, uh, because China is the other camp. Uh, so you by basically diversify the risk through this way. That's why I said it may hasten the splitting of the world uh, into, into currency blocks uh, where they, you know, these countries will, will actually adopt are uh, more likely to to or, or have more incentive to 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 adopt renminbi as their foreign reserve. Uh, it, I I do think that this this really do have this kind of uh, does have this kind of effect uh, in, in the medium run or, or long run. Uh, and this this actually echoes the point uh, 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 that David and Alicia also said that about, about this kind of so called decoupling or 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 things like that. Uh, so, so you have camps now. Now these camps, you know, where China may be sort of the head of this camp, uh, this RMB camp or 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 uh, or uh, a camp that is is, is non-Western camp in some sense, uh, you, you, with the currency block, you know, uh, center around uh, perhaps the renminbi uh, or, or not at least the non-Western uh, currencies. Uh, so I think it's a big deal. Okay, yeah. I think, uh, David, go ahead, David. Yes, really, Mike. Um, I, mean, I, I think it's also a big deal. I, I take the point that it has been uh, implemented in a targeted manner. So there are some Russian banks that are kind of outside for oil and gas um, um, uh, income transfers. And I, I get the Iran point and, and the Afghanistan point, but it seems to me that, I mean, going back two months ago, SWIFT was seen as kind of the nuclear option. Um, you know, freezing central bank reserves on a G20 country at least had not been done uh, before. So I think the fact that the West uh, has gone that far uh, signals, firstly, a sense of um, you know outrage at what the Russians have done. Like this is just you know, beyond the beyond the pale, if you like. Then we have to respond aggressively. Uh, but also, quite clearly, at least to me, signals a an explicit politicization you know, of these instruments. These are not simply kind of technocratic kind of financial system architecture. These are things that have kind of political content to them, which is not you know, obviously a completely brand new point, but I think it signals that the West, broadly defined, is prepared to use these instruments. Uh, and I think to Edwin's point, it is going to force uh, countries to figure out what sort of risk exposure uh, they want to bear, you know, to the US dollar, to Euro, um, you know, so alternatives will be um, development. This is a big argument for not doing SWIFT. Right, would expedite the development of alternatives to SWIFT, would fragment the global financial system, and the US and, uh, and Europe and others have decided that it's a kind of it's a price worth paying. So I think this is a this is a reasonably uh, big deal, uh, and I think you know, this this process of kind of more an accelerated process of decoupling and fragmentation is is, is likely. You know, you know, despite the fact that there are these kind of carve outs from the sanctions spur bank and, and, and the like. So, yeah, you know, my, my sense that it is a pretty big um, it is a pretty big deal. Uh, and, and I think it, it does make it more likely uh, that we see these kind of measures implemented again uh, in the context of you know, sufficiently material uh, political disputes. I think the world has the world has changed. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Uh, there was a related question from one of the participants, uh, and and do you know traditionally we think of the use of sanctions, it's certainly in a game theoretic sense, as tit for tat, right? Uh, this is to elicit desired cooperative behavior. Uh, to what extent do you think that with this current round of sanctions, that motivation, tit for tat, just punishment for one round, and it, once you're cooperative again, 
we remove the punishment. Do you, to what extent do you think with this particular round of sanctions, the motivation has moved to, we want to beggar thy neighbor. And, but beggaring thy neighbor also means to a large extent hurting yourself, right? Or you're, you're willing to take a hit to your own interests, uh, economic or financial interests. Uh, and if so, you know, sanctions aren't really rational in, 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 in if, if they do not produce the kind of desired, uh, I think all of you touched on, or at least David and Alicia did, in the short term, you don't think you'll change Russia's behavior. Uh, but do you think that, that the motivation of sanctions in this particular round has, uh, has, has evolved, has changed away from tit for tat to a beggar thy neighbor? Maybe, maybe I'll respond to, to your question first mm, on, sure. on whether it's I mean, rational. Yeah. I think it's, uh, even, even if it's, uh, you know, it, even if we don't expect that the behavior will change uh, immediately, we, we should also think about the threat of sanctions, you know, ex ante, right? So uh, exactly. if, you never, if, if you never use sanctions, and in this case, they have been used, uh, uh, then, you know, the threat of sanctions is not effective. So I think uh, the use of sanctions here is not only for this particular situation, but also saying that we're ready or whoever, again, not, not me, but whoever is uh, implementing them is ready to use the sanctions to the extent that, uh, you know, nuclear options like SWIFT uh, uh, to, to the extent of, of altering the behavior, right? So, uh, so I think it's, the, you know, I don't, I don't think uh, anyone in, 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 in Russia, uh, Russia's decision makers uh, is, is, is troubled by, by you know sanctions and that would change the behavior although i don't know you know there's there's some discussion on, on what the, the closest circle is uh, is uh, is experiencing uh there's other discussions of course that we you could uh, have heard of what implications this might have on the uh some regions in russia that are experiencing sanctions and and, and how that might create some internal dynamics within the country uh that uh you know it's very hard to project without uh, knowing all the uh, dynamics, uh, knowing everything that is happening, but uh, uh, you know there might be some knock-on effects uh, within uh, uh, Russia that's coming from the sanctions uh, and well, and economic uh, uh, difficulties uh, uh, coming out of sanctions, not the sanctions themselves. Uh, but I think it's it's still important to use the sanctions uh, in in the sense of you know creating a threat for for the future behavior. And, and to maintain credibility, that those threats right, must be right, implemented. Right, right. To be time, you have to be time consistent. And it, it should be it should be costly to you too, right? So it, <laughs> uh, I totally agree. Yeah, and we, so so this is a, another game theoretic framework would be the game of chicken. Right? You you have to commit to staying the course if you already made the threat. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah, even if even at the expense of hurting yourself. Yeah. Well, I I I I think uh, you know both Alicia and. Uh, Aminas and David had, had talked uh, a lot about the, the, the fact that sanctions are oftentimes not very useful. I also echo that point. Um, I, I feel that that, that in, in, in the short run or even medium run is not going to change Russia's behavior. So, so even, I mean, uh, I, I actually have a feeling that, that sanctions uh, are more like a political uh, action than economic uh, action in a sense that the the, the, the constituencies the constituents uh, will, will want, expect you to to impose sanctions so 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 you you have to do it i mean the politicians have to respond to constituents so they they, they do it uh and and so so uh yeah i mean the, the interesting question is uh can you actually commit to it uh and 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 withdraw it uh even if it doesn't change the the, the other side's behavior uh, uh, can, can you stop it? Uh, even the, the other side doesn't change its behavior. That is actually kind of, I think in some sense, they, they will try and ex if they want to stop it, they, they'll find an excuse to stop it, right? I mean, they say, oh, maybe certain, they'll find, they'll, they'll find some excuse to say, okay, maybe, maybe think that Russia might have changed, you know, that, that the behavior might have changed. They have find find some reason to 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 stop it. I, I believe they, they can always find some reason to step down. Yeah, that's what that's my view. Yeah, maybe that's a good point to pick up on uh, de-escalation. Right? Oh, Alicia, you you have your hand raised, so go ahead, Alicia. Um, yeah, I just wanted to clarify, just for the sake of clar of clarity, that I don't think sanctions are ineffective. I just think that. Um, uh, they're they're not going to harm the global economy as much as they're going to harm the Russian economy. That was actually what I was trying to say. 
Uh, but I agree with Edwin that uh, the reason why they might not be as effective, no matter the, I mean, um, Edwin said that the the freezing of reserve has passed the you overcome. I mean, yes, it's it's a strong action, but I I want to argue that it was necessary. I mean, and, and we've not mentioned the word Ukraine so far, which. I have to say, you know, it's not all about Russia here. Let's put it this way. Uh, there is a victim. And I think we can argue that there is a victim. And the whole idea here of the sanctions is a protection for the victim, whether we agree or not, you know, anybody can guess, I mean, or have its own judgment. But the sanctions are here for that purpose. And the... Uh, the argument to freeze the central bank is a little bit um, selfish from the European side, in my opinion, because it's a because they couldn't stop, they couldn't impose commercial sanctions as in Iran because they were dependent on the gas and, and oil. And by the way, didn't ask anybody else not to import. I insist with that because they were importing themselves. Then they could only stop the stock, not the flow. They couldn't stop the flow, so they thought, let's stop the, the stock. I, le, they've not stolen, sorry to say, those reserves. They're still there. They belong to Russia, but they cannot access the account. That's the point. Russia, however, has indeed, uh, you know, for all um, purposes, nationalized the assets of the 500 companies that have left. So if you are going to make a net uh, account of who is getting what, maybe actually if it, it might not be so bad for Russia after all, it's just the access. But eventually when those sanctions are lifted, they will have access to their accounts. Now I have a question for Edwin, which relates to the PBOC, if I may, because I'm very interested in this issue. So China has 90, the equivalent of 90 billion in research at the, not necessarily at the PBOC because this could be sovereign bonds, this could be anything, yeah? I mean. The, they don't sit, it's a liability, yeah? I mean, they could be, but the point is that um, Russia, since China has not sanctioned Russia, yeah, uh, should be able to, to take this 90 billion equivalent in renminbi. And then the point is, uh, will China, I first uh, indeed allow for that conversion, sell of, of the bond, I guess there's no reason why China wouldn't do that, Second, convert it to dollar. Because, you know, frankly speaking, if, if we follow this line of argument that this has been, uh, I, I can't remember the word, but it's something like uh, not nice, which I agree. The question is, could China do something nicer? And, and I'd like to hear uh, if that's feasible and possible. I see, interesting. So, so, uh, I, so, so you said uh, Russia uh, has some RMB asset right i'll be denominated yeah, 80 percent of reserves are in renminbi equivalent 90 billion dollars sorry to that, that, that's true that's true actually russia has quite a lot of renminbi uh reserve actually uh, uh quite a lot i mean as a percentage it's actually quite large uh renminbi uh in fact if i last time i checked uh the russian central bank's uh, foreign reserve uh Probably the percentage of renminbi is actually higher than the percentage of U.S. dollar. <laughs> Last time I checked, it, it seems to be true. Uh, so, so the question is whether you can sell this. Uh, uh, they, they can access it. I, I, I think they are. They can because because China is not sanctioning Russia, so so they can sell sell their uh, and then uh, uh, and then and then they can um, they can increase the. Uh, yeah, they can sell it, the 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 the, the renminbi asset, and, and depending on what what they want to get back, they can they 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 can get back Russian uh, currency, obviously, uh, I I think, uh, but they may not be able to get back uh, the Western currencies. I I think uh, they, uh, let's see. Uh, Mm, this is a good question. Whether whether you can sell the the, the renminbi for for the uh, well, technically China's been not being sanctioned. That you have a renminbi asset, uh, but they know they know it belongs to the Russian central bank. So so I think it, that's a that's a problem. 
uh, I think I think I think I think they cannot. They probably cannot cannot convert into Western currency. But then it will still have the effect if the let's say if the Russian sell the RMB asset and then buy the uh, the uh, uh, the Russian currency, that would still help to prop up the the demand for the Russian currency. So as a result, I think that may be the reason why the the, um, the exchange rate of the of the Russian currency uh, has, has bounced back to the pre the pre uh, the pre uh, pre sanction level. That may be the reason because uh, because the Russia can still buy you know sell their RMB asset and then buy the the buy back their 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 uh, their, their Russian currency at, uh, uh, Russian currency to prop up the currency. So that's 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 my understanding. Yeah, mm. that, that that explains partly at least uh, the 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 recovery of the ruble in the last week. I think. Uh, uh, so I think thanks very much to all our panelists. I'm afraid. I mean, we can go on for much longer. I think there were also a lot of very interesting questions uh, from our participants around uh, growth strategies, uh, growth models in emerging markets. Uh, not least China's dual circulation strategy, which on hindsight looks very precise, right? Uh, given this more fragmented, uh, uh, more of a block world, it seems that China would have to ramp up its uh, uh, domestic economy, uh, particularly domestic consumption spending as an engine of growth. Uh, uh, it also, I think that in, in the block world, there, there are also a lot of repercussions and, and difficult questions that other emerging, smaller emerging economies will have to grapple with. The more fragmented world that David talks about is, will be a more, will be a costlier, uh, uh, more inefficient world. Uh, you have to maintain, uh, you know, if it's, you know, if you have currency blocks, then besides choosing, you, you probably have to maintain a, a, a less optimal allocation of your foreign reserves into different currencies. Uh, so, so I think for smaller emerging markets that, are not China, the, 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 the fragmentation that we are seeing is going to raise very difficult, challenging uh, questions for, for many of us. Uh, I'm afraid we're out of time, but it just leaves me to thank our uh, panelists, our speakers for you know, taking the time to share with us their insights on the Ukrainian crisis and what that means for longer term, what that means for emerging markets in this part of the world. So thank you, uh, Alicia, David, Edwin, Elminas, for, for your time and for your generous sharing of your insights. And to our participants, thanks for joining us. And we hope to see you again at the next IEMS event. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, have a good thank day. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All the best. Bye-bye.